Go in. Morning. Morning. I'm Boz. I'm Mr. Chris. Uh, uh, Jen. Jen. Nice Good to meet you. Sarah. Nice, nice to meet you too. Welcome. Good to see you. Yeah. Glad you're here. Is, is your last name perhaps Jenico or Janako? Janako. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I tell people to think of Taco, although it's not the best image. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> see, I live in a, um, the, the town next to where I usually teach is in Saco. It's, it's called Saco, so I can say, think of Saco. Yeah. And that, that makes it easier. <laughs> that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And then is, I do have Megan's name on the first yeah, slide. Yeah. Is it Mies or Mies? Mies. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And Morgan Gresham, who joined okay. us after I Megan. Asked. Yeah, I didn't. I don't have her name on the slide, uh, but I think I, I can. Put, I put it on. You did? Oh, on your slides. Like our slides. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to be like, FYI, not just my project. Yeah. Like, there's other people involved. Yeah. So it's on there. I want to talk a little bit about you know, that. It's pretty important. Okay. So like, it's why we're doing it. Oh, yeah. So it's going to be kind of simple. Sure. Cool. Um, and I wanted to ask some money on this. I feel embarrassed that I don't know how to pronounce this person's name. But I I was going to mention that, you know, we were sort of influenced by the Black Women. Wait, just a Is it Chris? Tice. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's how I. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was what I was like. I've heard that before, but yeah. it's one of those names that. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was like, Chris will understand because he has his yeah. connection in your. Yep. I have one of those names. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you say it? Bass gear. Yeah. Bass like a fish. You're like a car. Yeah. My wife, when she taught elementary schoolers, she had literally like on board, she had a picture of a fish. <laughs> and then a picture of a car, but then sometimes the, the kids would call him his fish car. <laughs> so that's, that's fine, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really cute. I've secured us a clicker. I don't know about y'all, but I have lots of animation in mind. And oh, fine. Click every six seconds. Yeah, I think it'll be good to, to just click there. Might want to test it. Yeah, it's good. Like it's it's good. Little little fussy, but, uh, I have another one too okay. in my bag. I don't like switch over. over. I, Go everywhere with mine. I can't believe I'm here without it. Yeah, yeah. I go everywhere with mine. That's I fill up things. Just it's one of those things. Where my yeah. Keys, so can... Although inevitably, I leave it plugged in in the classroom. Yeah. My, <laughs> my is leaving it turned on in my briefcase for six months. Ah, well, that's yeah. <laughs> so you go everywhere with the spare set of batteries as well. I wish I'm getting there. <laughs> Not quite that much of a boy scout. <laughs> uh, sometimes for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it never has occurred to me to travel with a clicker until we were uh, you were in the same talk that I was in yesterday mm -hmm. the day before where you were like, hey, do you need a clicker? I've got this one. And I was like, oh my God, this travel book is over. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Awesome. Yeah, just a little USB <laughs> thing that pops out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem is you can't get on a plane with that. <laughs> <laughs> my best friend's dad called him up one day i was like all right listen i was i was getting to the airport and i realized i still have my pocket knife so before i went through security i put it in a potted plant that's at this particular place outside the terminal and I need you to go get it for me <laughs> so right over there and sure enough it was still sitting there yeah you managed to hide it there because it was like a family yeah, yeah. kind of thing yeah. so yeah <laughs> that, aren't there usually lockers like, like like couldn't you just leave them maybe you can't in an airport anymore yeah bus station kind of i'm not sure if that was yeah surely they had lockers yeah. Probably it's, it's a creative space. Solution. Yeah. <laughs> well, he would have just had to have left the key somewhere, though. Well, he could have just yeah, taken it and gotten it back. Here, right? It's not yeah. the probably on, you know, on security camera and take the plant and, you know, security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. If that got picked up, that probably wouldn't have been very good. <laughs> What's this guy trying to do? Mm. If this would be helping to keep us on track a little bit on time. Oh, be fine. I know. Um, I think we'll have plenty. I'm going to, my part's going to be pretty quick. Um, I'm going to present just a little bit of data that didn't have a home in any other projects, but I thought it fit here. So yeah. um, kind of set the stage and then, but I, I don't think I'll even be going for 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Right, so I won't stress too much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to like, you know, an hour or anything, I right? Guess. Maybe well, I'm not exactly good. good. <laughs>
<laughs> no. That's okay. No hard feelings. <laughs> Better to know now than later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, funny. Oh, that goes. You might have to might have to click hard in a way. Like uh, I was kind of the first um, yesterday. It was just like not going, and then we're gonna use my clicker. Always use your clicker. Maybe that's just me. I came to my current job. I think. Yeah, yeah, that's much better. <laughs> yeah, is that good? Do you like that? I do like it. I, I've been on stage now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm more comfortable talking to 500 people than I am. <laughs> Good for you. Well, sometimes <laughs> when I'm around 500 people, it's great. But which was interesting in the sense I'm not an engineer or even remotely close to one. So. Wow, yeah, that's a big jump. It's been interesting. It has been fun. Sometimes you set your goals and sometimes it goes. Yeah. We were talking about that just at the beginning. Yeah. Like how there seems to be like a meandering sort of, you know, first I was doing this and then I went this way and then I went that way. You know, it, it's kind of an interesting crowd. Yeah. I was in that room with two children. I was four years old guy at one point. <laughs> Finally divorced, they gave jobs as one of them for 17 years now. So oh, that's great. So <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I mean, this time. One of those life is changeable mix of I couldn't have made this story up if you'd asked me. You know, told me 15 years ago that I'd be here. Yeah, totally different. That's interesting. That that was the yeah, yeah. good for you. Go ahead and share that. Yes. Didn't know if someone had written like introduction to the based on it. Just go ahead and share it. That's fine. Thank you, Sharon. The design. Cool. We're going to go ahead and get started since we're at nine o'clock. Thanks to everybody for being here on the morning of the last day of the conference. I hope you've had a good one. I'm Chris Baskier. I'm at Auburn University. Uh, and this is K K2, Fourth Views of ePortfolio and WAC with and CAC Connections. Um, I'm joined today by Jennifer Janako, Boz Bowles, and Sarah Zappelin. Um, and uh, we are, uh, this panel has got grown out of a special issue of Across the Disciplines uh, that I'm co-editing with Amy Shikino and Helen Chen on ePortfolios uh, in the Disciplines and Professions. And the idea is that uh, we're exploring how ePortfolios can uh, support teaching and writing and learning goals specific to WACWID and CAC contexts. Um, and as well as the profession more broadly as well. So we have several other contributions to that issue, but uh, um, we thought this would be a good panel to put together to kind of give a uh, flavor of the different dimensions of the ways in which we're thinking about the special issue. Um, I'm gonna start off just with like a, a little bit of a talk to whet your appetite, but really they're the stars of the show. So I'm gonna kind of go very quickly through this. 
Uh, but I'm going to be talking about the ways that principles of high impact practices have influenced uh, our ePortfolio and uh, writing cross curriculum <laughs> initiatives at Auburn. Um, just a little bit of uh, history. Auburn's ePortfolio project was the uh, former, uh, now uh, I guess officially ended quality enhancement plan for uh, Auburn's accreditation in the SAC COC. Um, luckily, we've been able to uh, continue to do it. It wasn't one of the, it hasn't been one of those things where um, it's just like officially ended. Its form has changed a lot over time, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit. Um, so our focus is has been on uh, helping faculty help students to create polished, uh, public-facing, integrative e-portfolios where students can showcase their knowledge skills and abilities to real world audiences like potential employers, graduate schools, community organizations, those sorts of things. Sometimes that we, uh, some programs do implement a little bit more of a learning portfolio model, but the idea is that it still kind of leads them to this more professionalized version of any portfolio in the end. And uh, there's been a lot of different kinds of faculty development support that have gone along with those over the years. Uh, there was uh, what we called the ePortfolio cohort. So this was the uh, collection of departments or majors or uh, sometimes non-academic units who had kind of signed on to say, we're invested in ePortfolios. We're going to work on implementing these in our specific context and units. And they got uh, certain kind of perks as part of doing that. Um, and so they were invited to regular ePortfolio chats that would happen on a monthly basis. Um, there was a newsletter that we did for a while, um, uh, workshops, we brought in guest speakers, um, uh, the, most of that happened before my time there. I should give credit to Margaret Marshall, our, uh, our founding director, who is the one who did this, and my, my colleague Miriam Marty Clark is in the room too, and she was instrumental in, in moving the project along too. Um, we had awards, uh, so we continue to do a student award for Best ePortfolio. We did faculty awards for a time. Um, there were lots of committees, um, and uh, then uh, the five-year mark of the QEP is like actually sort of when it ends from SAC's perspective. And so we did an assessment institute where we brought in faculty from across disciplines and uh, had them assess student ePortfolios according to our uh, ePortfolio rubric and use that also as kind of a formative experience. And there was some research that uh, my colleagues had uh, published on that that showed that faculty got, uh, grew more confident in their ability both to teach and assess ePortfolios through the process of doing that assessment institute as well. Um, right around 2019, Margaret and I uh, were trying to think about uh, what did we want to do next? How did we want to kind of evolve the ways that we were working with faculty? One of the issues that we had noticed was that when we were giving grants out, some of the faculty then became super involved. And when, when they got that money, it let them really do a lot of work. Some we wouldn't hear from until they submitted a final report, and some we would just never hear from after we gave them the money. So we were thinking, how can we be more engaged with them and help them move a project along in a way that was uh, grounded in how we wanted uh, them to hopefully be engaging with ePortfolios and using good pedagogy and that sort of thing. Um, so we came up with this idea for academies for writing, uh, which would be an extended experience where we would be leading them through workshops and through the development of materials and integration of those materials into their curricula. Um, those have taken different forms over the years, and I'd be happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But the kind of organizing principle that we used for those academies were the eight features that are common to high impact practices that have been identified uh, by Ku, O'Donnell, and Schneider. Um, so, now it's not, now mine's not going to click. Can you try clicking on the PowerPoint? Yes. There we go. Okay. Uh, so, the per performance expectations set at appropriately high levels, significant investment of concentrated effort over an extended period of time, interactions with faculty and peers about substantive matters, uh, experiences with diversity. Frequent, timely, and constructive feedback, opportunities to discover relevance through real, real world application, public demonstration of confidence, and periodic structured opportunities to reflect and integrate learning. So, 
um, not only did we share these principles with them, but we actually used these as a um, organizing trope for our own faculty developments. So in other words, we wanted faculty to experience all of these things so that they could kind of get the sense of what was that like before they implemented it. And so we've uh, done that in the space of ePortfolios, but we've also expanded it to other kind of high impact activities, uh, like, you know, our more general kind of writing across the curriculum, WACWID kind of projects, uh, course-based undergraduate research. My, one of my favorite ones though is the multi-course uh, professional simulation. So this was um, the Department of Poultry Science. They basically came up with a hypothetical poultry co-op and all of their assignments were uh, to help students run the co-op more or less. So they would be doing things that were like, you know, documentation for the uh, FDA or, um, sorry, the USDA um, or, you know, different kinds of things like that. And so that's been pretty cool uh, to see them implement that. So um, I wanted to know uh, to what extent were faculty experiencing these eight high impact features when uh, regardless of kind of wit which kind of HIP they were implementing and to what extent were they more interested or more willing to try to implement these features in their own pedagogy as well. So I set out just a little survey to them, uh, to the folks who had participated over the years to see uh, what they had experienced. Um, I got 24 people who responded. And so you can see these are the eight features of HIPs here um, and the percent of agreement or strongly agreement uh, is pretty high overall in terms of that as a participant in the academy, they said, yeah, yeah, I did experience these things. Um, you can see the diverse people circumstances or perspectives is a little lower, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and also just a note, when I first sent out the survey, I forgot to I forgot to put that last question there, so I had to send it out separately, which is why the end's only 19 on, uh, on that one. Oops, happens sometimes. <clears throat> um, so then I also asked them, how likely are you to actually implement these features in your own teaching? Um, and again, you can see the percent strongly agree is mostly in the 90s, 75% um, for demonstration of learning to others. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and so overall, the takeaways that I, that I get from this is that faculty uh, do recognize the uh, HIP features when they're used intentionally to uh, structure faculty development experiences. And I got this lovely quote, uh, uh, interactions were collegial, practical, and relevant. I felt that after 18 years of teaching, I was getting my first look at educational pedagogy, let alone teaching of writing enhancement. So I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> um, uh, but uh, diversity needs to be a more intentional focus of these kinds of faculty development efforts. Um, so some of those numbers were a little bit lower. And somebody said uh, diversity, other than that of thinking about teaching differently, wouldn't have struck me as a central goal, goal for the academic sessions. I mean, were we shooting for that as well? So um, I've been working on trying to be more intentional about uh, building in conversations about DEI into uh, the academies over the last year or so with mixed success, but at least I'm, you know, it's there and uh, trying to get that to happen. Um, and then I think this is probably no surprise. There are continued structural obstacles that can prevent folks from uh, uh, actually integrating some of the high impact practices into their teaching. Uh, when we're thinking about reflection and uh, peer feedback and especially that public demonstration of competence, right? Um, so this person is talking about how they teach very large lecture classes. Um, and uh, so it's really hard, especially when they don't have GTA support to be able to do a lot of this work. And they mentioned platforms like Eli Review. Um, they recognize that that can be a way to scale up um, some of this uh, writing in large courses, but they're worried about passing that cost on to students um, as well. So uh, I don't have a magic answer to that one, right? But it's just something that I'm always trying to be aware of and maybe to communicate to faculty that they need to be, adapt this framework to whatever works for them in their local context as well. So that's kind of uh, just like I said, a really quick uh, um, uh, example of how I'm building connections across e-portfolios and writing across the curriculum uh, in our work through those high impact practices. But like I said, I'm not the star of the show here. So I'm gonna pass it over to Jen, Thanks. who is going to talk about uh, her work with nursing. 
I can't decide if I'm going to sit or stand, so I'm going to start sitting. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> so um, thank you all for being here. Again, appreciate you coming out uh, on the last day of the conference um, in the morning. Um, I'm Jen Janako from the University of New England. Um, I am the DigiSpace Coordinator and Multimodal Writing Specialist. Uh, it's always fun when you have a title that takes a couple of breaths. Uh, so um, I work out of the Student Academic Success Center. Um, and I just wanted to start by acknowledging that this work, as um, Chris has referenced, is unpublished as of right now. We are working on revision, um, and it is based on the work that I did with my colleague, Deb Kramlick, who is, was the interim director of nursing at the time. Um, also, a lot of the work that we um, have done in this project comes out of my experience with working with uh, Michael Cripps, who is not, we are not an official WAC program, but he brings a lot of WAC concepts. Um, and so I came into this role um, from the role of an uh, English adjunct who taught composition for several years. Um, and so a lot of the, the things that we worked through and, and the way that we, um, the, the information I brought came from a lot of that experience. Um, so this is a quick overview of what I'll be looking at today, what I'll be sharing with you today. Um, I'd also want to just talk a little bit about how um, at UNE and nursing, we are at just at the very beginning of this process. So um, unlike Chris, uh, we are really just getting started. Um, and so ePortfolio did not get integrated into nursing until 2019. Um, we have had some ePortfolio work through English composition work, but again, not scaled up. Um, so we have a little bit of a base of knowledge of how that might integrate um, but this is really our first through a program um, experiment. So um, this is a little bit about UNE. So I'm gonna just highlight specifically um, the, la the parts that are in green, um, <laughs> because this is how our nursing program might be a little bit different from others. Um, so we have two tracks. We have our BSNs who are our um, kind of more traditional students, uh, four-year program. Um, and then we have our ABSNs who are accelerated um, in an accelerated BSN program. They come to us with a degree. Uh, it doesn't have to be a healthcare related degree. Uh, it can be any other degree um, from a, a, a tr traditional bachelor's degree. So um, they have a 16 month um, program, whereas the BSNs have a four year program. But again, the BSNs um, really only take, a, uh, at this point, two nursing courses in their first two years. For this sample, it was one nursing course in their first few years. So why that matters is that there's um, a lot of, uh, although the, the curriculum parallels, um, it's, it's not the same track. So in other words, a BSN might take one class in their second to last semester, but an ABSN might take that same class in their final semester. Um, so we were really looking to understand better um, how we could help students get their portfolios ready to be more of a career portfolio, um, particularly for nursing students, because um, they take a lot of the, the standardized tests, and that's really how they show their content knowledge. Um, but we were looking to help them also show those other skills that were that are important in nursing, but that don't get sort of tested in the same way. So that was really the focus of what we were looking to do as we were building this project. Um, our sample is of 40 portfolios um, from graduates from the May 2021 ABSN group and, and 2022 um, ABSN and BSN groups. So we're looking at about 20% of our graduates from those um, four cohorts. Um, the questions that we started off with um, were, again, that we, you know, we're, we're sort of new to this in terms of structuring throughout the time. Um, so we were looking to better understand how students use reflective practice to demonstrate that they're able to think like a nurse. And basically that was sort of, again, focused on how are they feeling like they're being professionalized um, and sort of where do they start? And then how do we see them move through that process of being professionalized? Um, and would there be a difference between these two groups? Because again, ABSNs come in with different experience educationally, but also many of them came in with work experience. So we were looking to see, were they integrating that experience into ePortfolio? Um, and then our last one really kind of came as we were designing is we, we didn't start with a project in mind. We were looking at, we're at the three-year point and we're like, okay, what do we need to know? So um, there's a lot of stuff that if we had started with it in mind, we would have done differently, but um, we were really just trying to make an assessment of where we were. 
Um, so that last one is, does our integration of ePortfolio rise to the level of curriculum? Um, again, based on um, Kathleen Yancey's idea of what it makes to be a port, what it is to be an ePortfolio maker, as opposed to using an ePortfolio to just sort of package a bunch of things. Um, and so we were trying to figure out how, how close are we to that? The answer is not close. Uh, and so, um, but we'll work on that. Um, so um, that's basically what we were looking to try to understand better. So I'll apologize, this slide is really too much text. Uh, so, uh, but we'll, we'll start with um, what's in the big blue boxes here. So um, my colleague Deb and another one of my colleagues developed these different types of reflection um, responses that they were seeing in some of these. So basically we kind of looked at it as um, how could we categorize these reflections and which of these different types of levels were the ones that we would think of were thinking like a nurse. Um, so the first one is descriptive. Again, anyone who teaches writing for any amount of time knows what that looks like. Um, so it was more summary, um, kind of describing what we would consider to be generic. In other words, the student did, you know, um, complete the assignment as asked, um, but maybe didn't bring anything more to it. Um, oftentimes that, that was what we were seeing for that descriptive one. Um, for responsive, it was more, there was some connection with the student's experience, but it was a pretty shallow connection typically. Um, and then the reflective and critically re reflective were, were the places where we're thinking this is more like thinking like a nurse, right? This is what we were um, seeing as the student uh, applied a concept, they uh, tried to grapple with something usually, um, they had to transform their own assumptions perhaps, or at least reaffirm the assumptions that they came in with. Um, and that kind of looked like, I'll show an example in just a second, but basically that kind of looked like um, things like how would you as a nurse handle euthanasia, right? So how does your value um, how can you kind of put your own value a little bit to the side to understand that somebody else's might be different and that's your job to advocate for what the patient wants, not just what you think. Um, another one that was one of my favorites was um, that, you know, they're, they're pretty surprised that old people like to have sex. I'll just say that. <laughs> so, um, so it was about, um, you know, they had to they had a guest speaker uh, and, you know, and they were, and so it really brought to the forefront, like they, you know, most of them were younger people. Um, so, so they had these guest speakers that would, would, would raise these issues with them. Right. And so that, that was one of their reflect, you know, that was a, a possible reflection they could have included in there. Um, so I should also mention that we had three samples. Uh, so we looked at a beginning post, a middle post, and an end post as much as we could. Um, because these, these were curated, some students chose to leave nothing from the beginning or middle and just highlighted a couple of things at the end. Um, whereas others left almost all of their content in, which again was not really what we were looking for, uh, but also it helped us to understand sort of where they were and how we could get better. Um, so we, let's see, our last thing here. Um, so our, our challenges were, well, like everybody's challenges in the past few years, um, there was a lot going on. Um, people were strapped with a lot of different types of changes and the way that they were um, uh, being expected to be educated or to educate students. Um, we also had a switch over of our LMS, which was another thing that um, made it a little hard to work with faculty to help them understand how to use WordPress, which is the um, <clears throat> software that we use for our ePortfolios. Um, and WordPress we chose because it's open source and it allows students to um, download all of the content from their portfolio and upload it into their own site if they would like to do that. It keeps everything for them. Um, so unlike a traditional LMS, it was very easy for us to say to them now, if you want to keep this, just do this, and this, and this, and you've got it, right? Um, so that was the reason that we started with WordPress. Um, and um, so, but it was still a challenge because it is a different software. It's not integrated with the other things. Um, and so again, it was another site they had to go to and learn how to manage. Um, and then I would say just that the, uh, the key takeaways were that um, the BSNs or the ABSNs did not significant, there was no significant change in the way that they reflected. So we thought that they would come in and be a little bit more critically reflective because they had that extra educational background and maybe work experience. We didn't see any evidence of that except for one cohort, which was the 2021 ABSNs. Um, and so there, but it wasn't significantly very different. Um, and then the final thing is that as we looked through um, and thought about how those 
um, folks either reached into that critical reflective space or in or reflective space or not. Uh, for the most part, students were, but of course that led us back to our prompts, which I'll show you is one example here. Sorry, this is a graphic picture. Maybe I should have told you that ahead of time. Um, so <laughs> it's about nursing. I assume you're okay with that. Um, so um, the ABSN prompt here is from our first, so again, this is a first term prompt. Um, and if you look at the very top there, maybe you can maybe read it. I'll try to read it out loud. Um, each sentence or each student is to take or shape an image or share an image, sorry, of any type of art. Uh, I can't read it from here. Maybe you can read it. I'm sorry. Um, so um, basically the idea was they were to find a piece of art that they thought represented art in nursing. Okay. So there was a couple of possibilities with that. Some of them took it as here's the actual piece of art and this is what the nurse is doing. Others talked about how art was or nursing was an art, but also then they connected that to the image, right? So really in creating this prompt, what we were trying to do is have a wide enough space so that we could take those students who were brand new to nursing um, and then also be able to, you know, so they could have a contribution and kind of explain what they saw as nursing, um, but also those who were not new to the healthcare professions could bring some of their knowledge into it as well. Um, so the first example is a descriptive example, mainly again, because this student obviously didn't make a, a, a strong connection with their own experiences. So what they did was they found this picture and you kind of see in the top right there, um, it's a visiting nurse, it's from 1924, it's a black and white picture. And the student highlighted a couple of things there. Um, so basically it was the idea that the nurse is a, was angelic um, in the way that she was uh, ministering to the um, child, to the person in the, you can't, sorry, you can't quite see it here, but there's a, there's a patient in the bed and, it, and the person is surrounded by the children. Um, the, the student looked at that as a chaotic environment uh, because there are children in the room. Um, and so, um, so again, we kind of see like that, that uh, there's a there's some concept there of what nursing is, uh, right? Except that maybe it's a, a concept that if, you're, if you've ever been uh, in a situation with a nurse, you realize it's not, you know, this is kind of an older way to, to see it. Um, and then the next one is critically reflective. Again, here is um, a contrast. This student clearly has a, a different understanding of what nursing is. Remember, these are both in the same cohort. Um, so this student comes in with experience as a doula. Uh, the spirit, uh, student goes through and explains how um, nursing is an art. It is a balance between knowledge and human connection. So again, we already have sort of a higher way of looking at it, not just the literal, what is a nurse? Um, and so then the student goes on to connect it to her own experience, but also she highlights that idea of collaboration with this picture. Um, since, since we have done some revision with this, um, we've, we've kind of moved it into um, the image of nursing as opposed to nursing as an art, just to try to clarify what students needed to do there. Also because of, um, you know, we're a little concerned about copyright use, like where students are putting things in that maybe should not be on a, a website if they choose to make it public. Um, and so that is a little bit of different now. Um, but then that, that, that last part of the prompt, explaining their choice and what it means to them, we wanted to clarify that, right? Because again, that, that kind of um, left it a little bit so that maybe that student who was just doing the minimal just says, this is what nursing means to me, moving on, right? Um, without maybe making some more significant connections that they could have made there. Um, so the next part of our project is a, was the curation part. Um, and basically what I was looking to see there was um, to look and see what, how can we understand what students are valuing from what we're giving them and what we're asking them to put into the portfolio. So we categorized in two different ways. Um, the, bot, the first one there is design and navigation, um, where we had what we call the default. These are all the assigned things and they just stayed there. Right? Um, so there really was no curation or there's very little curation. The second level was the, the what we call the gutter category. Like it was like, there was a little bit, but maybe it didn't quite get done or maybe it doesn't exactly make sense altogether. Um, and the last part was much more curated, meaning there were multiple ways that you could reach content. The student had clearly made some choices. Um, and again, this doesn't have to do with the customization of the site. It has to do with the content of the site. Um, so our greatest challenges with this were again, some pandemic related. Um, we were we were inconsistent in the way that we could deliver how to use this tool technically. So some students had in-person instruction on how to use it. Others had Zoom instruction. Others had we're six feet apart and I'm kind of trying to yell, no, the button on the right, like, you know, and so it, it was it was a little bit um, tricky there. 
Um, also, <clears throat> we think that there may have been some possible tech overload as part of why students didn't engage as much. Um, and then finally, the lack of buy-in because I didn't have as much time to work with faculty as I really needed um, to help them see the value of portfolio. Um, the key findings here are that our students did um, curate to some extent, but again, we're looking at, uh, I think that was more just, you know, I, I needed to do a better job and, and restructure something so that it would make sense for them. So here are a couple of examples on that. Um, the first one is a default, meaning if you look at the top, you can see there's a number of categories across. Um, those pages are related to particular courses, right? So it was, you create the page that is connected to this content, you give the course learning objectives um, on that page, and then you just list the content underneath it. Um, and then the assigned generic was, in other words, there was no um, there was no real customization for the student. It was, again, just what was asked. Um, this next one was curated. Um, you can tell because at the top, you can see those categories are not the same. They're based on skills. Um, and so that person then was able to say, okay, I want to highlight this skill. So I'm going to get all the content that's related to that and put it under the collaboration category. And then there's like three or four posts under that. Um, and then you can see there's some others like leadership and ethics. Um, again, we had some different features that the student included as well. You'll see it's an about me page. It's the landing page. So it kind of highlighted, this is where I want you to start. And so that helped us understand that that student had taken some time to curate and choose the content. Um, our takeaways and next steps, uh, the green boxes are things that are in process and, and already happening, um, and the blue boxes are those that need to be revisited. Um, so the first one is the uh, to improve buy-in. We're looking to gather testimonials from students who have shared their e-portfolios. We have a couple of really great examples of that. So I've made some um, videos to kind of highlight that, and I'm showing them as part of the beginning of e-portfolio launch so that students have a better understanding of what they're supposed to be doing here. Um, and then the timing of instruction, we had to, again, move things around, move things around to try to figure out what's the right connections there. Um, right now, we've got it broken into two different visits from me. So I come in and get them started on curation, and then I come and follow up a few weeks later, ideally, um, to help them kind of continue in the process of curation. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the last piece is, um, I'd say just in terms of things that need to be looked at again, uh, I think we we have a bigger issue than we thought about understanding how people are integrating with technology, what we can expect of students, of faculty. Um, oftentimes, I think we get to that space of thinking like, well, you know, we just came out of the pandemic. Everybody knows how to use the stuff now. And that's just not true. <laughs> so um, there's that last thing, reflective practice. Uh, I need to come back in, take a look at those prompts again, work with faculty, and we need to map how they're going to fit together um, so it feels a little bit less uh, here and there. So thank you. All right. Uh, good morning. My name is Boz Bowles, and I work for the uh, College of Engineering at, at LSU. Um, my co-authors and I are also in the revision process with this paper. Uh, we asked for an extra week since I was coming here and since they're teaching in Paris and all kinds of other things right now. <laughs> so we'll get there. Uh, but um, Rebecca Burdett is our director, uh, Anne-Marie Galusha is our associate director, and Jennifer Baumgartner is our faculty chair. Um, and the, me the medal on the right there, or on the left, I'm sorry, is actually the, um, the medal that our distinguished communicators uh, Earn, and I'll talk more about that right about now. Uh, just a quick background on the program. We started in 2005 uh, with the first studio opening in the College of Engineering. It, I'm sorry, we started in 2004. First studio opened in 2005 in the College of Engineering. Uh, the program was begun with a generous gift from the Kane Foundation, an engineering alum, and he said he wanted it to be an engineering program. And the foundation at LSU said, can we please make it campus-wide? And he said, yes, but engineering first. So as a result, we're the oldest and most established of the studios on campus. We came to LSU as part of the QEP in 2005. And uh, so a lot of the choices we made early on were driven by assessment needs and requirements, uh, things like PR that we had never thought about as English teachers all of a sudden were very important to us, uh, which is part of the reason why we call ourselves CXC as opposed to CAC, because we had a really cool graph that it looked like the infinity symbol in a chain link and all of that. So PR matters. Um, <laughs> It's a campus-wide initiative uh, aimed at improving communication skills of undergraduates in the discipline. So we are an undergraduate-focused uh, program. We focus on four modes, writing, speaking, visual, and 
We made the bold choice in 2004 of deciding that technological communication merited its own mode. And I think uh, the last almost 20 years have borne that out. Um, and uh, there are four pillars of our program. The first one is communication intensive courses. These are courses where they're taught by professors in the disciplines, but we have, as you see there, the next thing or the bottom, well, third thing, studios that are there to support the, uh, the students as they go through these CI courses. Additionally, there is a distinguished communicator program, and that is the program where people opt into uh, doing a digital portfolio. They do this if they've taken enough CI courses and made uh, at least a B or better in those courses when they get credit for them. They have to take four courses, three of them touching writing, two touching speaking, one visual and one technological. And um, they work with an advisor of their choosing. So this is not somebody that's just assigned to them in a computer that hopefully it's someone that they already know that they have a rapport with that they're comfortable working with. So uh, as a result, when that works well, it becomes a mentoring uh, position because they know the students' skills, they know their goals, they know them quite well. So they're you know ideal people to later on write letters of recommendation, help with networking, that kind of thing. Some of you, um, this, this is a fairly young audience, I think, so some of you may not remember the climate back in 2004, but we weren't really talking much at that time about things like transfer. It was a very specific desire for focus on writing, speaking, and there were a few forward-thinking programs that were talking about visual communication, and there were even a few that were looking at technology like we were. Um, <clears throat> early on, uh, <clears throat> because of the nature of the program, um, we used to... Early on, we used to have to make the sale both to professors that they should make their course a CI course and then to the students that they should opt into the program. Um, <clears throat> it was a very steep learning curve at the time. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember uh, trying to put things together for uh, file transfer protocol websites, building websites with Dreamweaver, things like that. Well, imagine interrupting a graphics class in engineering where they're learning software and auto, uh, SolidWorks and AutoCAD and say, time out for two weeks while I teach you Dreamweaver. That was quite a sell. Um, and then we also did this thing back then um, where, um, you know, like I say, we had the, the coverage versus depth of learning sale to make. So that was a major thing. And you see all the things that we were requiring back then. Back then we had uh, five different reflection prompts as a requirement of the portfolio. Um, at that time, we were very concerned with forcing students to put themselves out on the web in ways that they might not have been comfortable with. Uh, so we had a private portfolio that was used for assessment purposes with the QEP and departmental assessments, any kind of assessments anybody wanted. They were ideal for that, but it was very labor intensive because back then we had to do things like collect a freshman or first year writing sample and then compare that with a senior writing sample and all the norming and everything uh, from people all over the campus with different disciplines. You can imagine the undertaking that was. And then we had the public facing portfolio. And like I said, we gave the students and their advisors the, uh, the choice of how much they would put in that portfolio. We made sure the private portfolio had everything we needed at the time for assessment. And we said to them, this is your portfolio, it's your career, it's your choices. So you and your, your advisor decide what goes in there. We did have a few requirements as you can see on the right. Uh, and they were all very much focused around specific modes of writing. Now, in every meeting and every sales pitch, we talked about multimodalities, but our focus was on, can they write well? Okay, let's separate that. Can they speak well? Over the years that, um, oh, I'm sorry, we ma loosely managed the feedback loop. I forgot to say this. We did not want to get in the business of getting in the middle of advisors and their students and managing those conversations, especially since we couldn't imagine all of the expertise of advisors all across campus. So we said, Handle it. It's your relationship with your advisor. This is, and later on, we decided this was probably an excellent way to promote interpersonal communication, which we find very difficult to teach in the class. So it was a very loosely managed feedback loop between the advisor and the student. I would also say in the early days, we were less concerned with, um, with rubrics and things like that. We were putting a lot more emphasis on the relationship between the advisor and the student and that advisor's willingness to vouch for the student. It was the advisor saying, this is distinguished in this field that we were saying, yep, that's good. We've moved on from that. <laughs> um, but still in phase one, I just want to show you, you'll see some of the rubrics we had back then. They were focused very much on the products, not so much on how you got there, why you would do it that way or anything else, but we needed this. This is a requirement. Do you have it? Yep. Check a box. And then also the, uh, the rest of the room was very focused once again on the individual modes of communication. 
Later, phase two, we still had the private portfolio, but the QEP had run its course. We were no longer needing it for that. Um, but there were several reasons why we kept the private uh, portfolio. Mainly, they were technological. Uh, but there were a few other things. We had um, some different uh, portfolio development planning kinds of things. Uh, a couple of the things we said we needed a demonstration of exemplary multimodal communication skills within the discipline. So we were beginning to embrace this idea of multimodality a bit more intentionally. I won't say we didn't know about transfer and multimodality and all these things. They were lurking in the back of our minds, but they were not the, the things that were said. They were not the buzzwords that they later became. So they weren't our focus. Uh, inclusion and articulation experiences beyond the classroom that enabled you to practice effective communication skills and prepare for your future field, including one which enables you to serve in a leadership role. So right there, we're beginning to, to lean into things like leadership, team working, critical thinking, some of the other uh, reasons to be a good communicator. We also, uh, in addition to your public portfolio, you must submit a spoken sample that appropriately demonstrates your mastery of oral communication. You may choose whether it is included in your public portfolio or submitted as a URL in your dear reviewer letter. I remember that these communication, these discussions started because we had an engineering student who had a stutter, and he struggled quite a lot with the idea of a spoken sample, putting it up on the web. He ultimately decided to, you know, I'm going to have this stutter. I'm going to have it when I'm looking for a job, so I'm leaning into it. And he gave a fantastic credit presentation with stutters, uh, but it was his choice to do that. We also had some technological limitations back then. Uh, even once we moved to some templates like uh, Wix and Weebly and Squarespace and some of the other WordPress, some of the others that were around, it was still very difficult to embed video in a website. I don't know if you guys remember how, you know, it wasn't that long ago that uh, you only could watch like two minutes on YouTube, right? So we, and, and, once again, these are students that have a full workload. So asking them to you know, time out from your engineering work, let's, let's be web designers for a bit, was quite an ask. Uh, but because of the, I think because a lot of the, um, the degrees were very competitive, students were able to take on, willing to take on the extra work. We also had a dear reviewer letter at that time that um, really was the message, was part of the reflection at that point. We did away with the five individual reflections and sort of folded reflective questions into the Dear Reviewer letter. Um, but as you can tell, it was a letter to an external person. So, you know, the reflection was not quite as intentional as it needed to be. Um, <clears throat> we have changed that now. Um, basically, uh, the Distinguished Communicator, uh, phase three, we now have a, uh, a three-part workshop that the students go through. We educate uh, the different faculty on what we're looking for with the portfolio so that they are better able to uh, help the students get through the process. One of the problems we had early on was we would ask for reflective writing, but we weren't actually in a writing class where we could talk about what reflective writing meant. So early on, we'd ask for reflections and we'd, we'd try to be as intentional in the question as we could, but very often we would still get things that were not useful. We got a lot of praise for how wonderful we are that felt great, but it wasn't really what we were looking for. Uh, we got a lot of complaints about you know this and that that had nothing to do with our program. And then sometimes we get something that was reflective in nature. So as a result, we got a lot more intentional about what we're asking the students to think about and how we're asking them to go through the process. Um, <clears throat> Also, we have now got it set so that the spoken sample is a required part of the portfolio. Um, now, obviously that brings up some issues uh, of uh, the same sorts of things. We've had people who are neurodivergent uh, in this program that were very hesitant about putting their, themselves up on the web. Um, <clears throat> but nowadays there are a lot of different ways to share information and you don't necessarily have to have your smiling face out there speaking. So we've basically broadened the ways that we accept that uh, spoken communication. And uh, we are requiring it now because, you know, we feel like it's, it's, it's accept we have acceptable ways to protect the students so that they can share. And once again, it is still their choice how much they put out on their public portfolio, except if they want the medal, we go see a few things. Um, so the things that we're looking for now uh, are the modes, but we want to also see how those modes have come together in leadership, in team working, in critical thinking, in all of these uh, sort of more important possibly uh, reasons to be engaged in communications. Um, <clears throat> we also have a brand new, one of the things we noticed was that the students who are getting the Distinguished Communicator Medal, they have to go through a review. It's a blind review at the end of the process. Um, their advisor votes, but then they also have to get uh, through a, a best two out of three reviews from a committee. And the committee is made up of people from their discipline. So we don't have like a tuba professor, you know, looking at the chemists or whatever. Um, but 
we, uh, because it was so much work, a lot of students would work for it and then not get the award and have nothing for all that labor. So a few years back, um, I don't remember exactly what year, but it's only been about three or four years, we instituted a new program called the LSU Communicator Certificate. This is for those that don't quite make it or don't have time to work on a portfolio. You know, some students have jobs and things and they can't take on that extra uh, uh, assignment. So the LSU Communicator Certificate gives them something tangible from the university to say you've done this communications work, you have these skills, but they don't go as far as the medal with the portfolio and all of the things to, to share uh, as public facing. One of the things we've done is we've, we've re required that every distinguished communicator, every medalist, earns the, the uh, certificate on the way to the medal. And that's where we have them reflecting. So everybody who gets the certificate writes a reflection. We have very carefully guided prompts now for those reflections. And uh, then they also still do the Dear Reviewer letter. So we've got something that is intentional, uh, talking about your choices to an external audience, a reflective piece, and then the public facing portfolio are what is required now. Um, <clears throat> Like I said, we've got a three-part workshop, and I know some of these pages are difficult to read. Don't try to read them. I'm just showing that you know, we actually have created documents and moved forward with it. One of the things that I, that I feel like I need to talk about is this idea of how the spoken mode has evolved with technology, because it's been sort of a coming together of what's possible with technology, what is being asked for from our administration and, and industry and all of that, and then also what is reasonable to ask for with busy students, you know, how much, how much time can we ask a chemical engineer to worry about cinematography so that the great presentation that was shot in a dark classroom looks better on the web? You know, we had a lot of questions like that. So early on, if you remember in 2004, these things didn't exist. You had blackberries if you were really important, right? <laughs> and we used to go up and talk about, does anybody remember flip cameras? Yeah, those things, but do they have like eight megapixels or something like that. But they had, a. for those of you who don't know, they had a little USB port that popped out and you could plug it right into your computer and easily download. What a miracle. I think you could put 10 minutes of video on the card that came inside it. I'm not sure, but it was, you know, certainly nothing compared to these things. Um, and we used to talk a lot back then about wussy wig design. Does anybody know that term? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What you see is what you get. In other words, it was a design view way to build portfolios so you didn't have to code. Imagine how many of my engineers were like, can I still code? <laughs> yes, okay. um, but that really limited the choices we could make and the requirements we could assign at the time. Because like I said, we were constantly asking ourselves what's important and then scoring that was what is technologically possible and then what is a reasonable ask. As the desire uh, to get a little bit more uh, granular with the purposes of the modal communications, we started, and once again, Smartphones, things like that started to happen. Uh, you know, the web, somebody remember the term web 2.0? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when blogs and wikis were gonna change the world, right? Um, all that seems so cute now in, in retrospect. But what it did with the, the spoken mode was it gave us more opportunities to, uh, to, to capture those videos, to, to put them up. And it also gave us new feedback uh, methods because we were able to capture video. And so it didn't, you know, you didn't have to give a presentation and then get shouted out, you know, right afterwards. You could post it and gather feedback and you know moderate the feedback if you felt the need to. We certainly did. Uh, so it was a very different time uh, for phase two. And then right around the time we were hearing, you know, one of the things y'all need to really focus on is internet communications. There was this pandemic, y'all may have noticed. And we now got a, um, I won't suggest that everybody knows everything there is to know about online presentations. Obviously they don't, but everybody kind of got uh, the, the ubiquity of Zoom forced everybody to at least start thinking about some of those things. And so those who are engaging with it now, we've actually come to pretty sophisticated, I believe, portfolios. Um, early on, like I say, we were very much focused on learning to communicate, writing, speaking, visual, and then a lot of questions about why would you choose technological? Well, because simulations, 3D printing, these things were happening, right? And then we eventually got to the broader idea of communicating to learn. Um, where we're going now, uh, we're moving uh, rubrics away from the benchmark of average. That's one thing that we uh, we still have in there. We used to start with a one to six Likert scale. You saw that. Then we came with some more uh, specific rubrics that asked, uh, you know, uh, it was still asking about this idea of the average. I can tell you there is a very different uh, idea of average for writing in engineering, say, than in English or history or whatever. So average is a troubling term to me. Plus, who wants to be compared to the average? I can't imagine anybody does. And then we are also looking at broadening the pool of reviewers. Right now, it is faculty that are the reviewers and the students choose them. 
uh, as far, I'm sorry, faculty are the advisors and the students choose them. And then that's their first reviewer. We usually have a committee of people from the disciplines that serve as the reviewers beyond that. Um, but we're thinking about bringing in some industry people. Now we're aware of all of the calibration that that's gonna cause, uh, require and all of the fun and games. We bring in industry for our classes all the time, but bringing them in as portfolio reviewers is uh, I think the, the way we're gonna have to go just because of uh, bandwidth of faculty. Uh, and then finally, we recognize we are unique and in a specific context, but we, like many of you, are looking uh, for collaboration to continue to further this. So that's really what I'm doing in the room today. So thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Zerhillen, and I am here um, representing um, some other colleagues as well, Morgan Gresham and, and Megan Myers and I Marsh. Um, so, and we are doing this research on behalf of the ABLE Task Force, and I always get this wrong, so sorry, I'm a member, but um, the Association for Authentic Experiential and Evidence-Based Learning, everybody on the task force was responsible for naming the organization. <laughs> we always say that, but um, so ABLE is an international organization interested in, in e-portfolios more generally. Um, and I joined the task force when it was formed by Amy Shahino, who's up there, and Megan Haskins in 2019. Um, really as a way to, to become more connected to the broader e-portfolio community and get support. Um, and, and so I'll tell you a little bit about that um, and then tell you about our project. But the goal of the task force that was created by the organization was to start creating some principles around digital ethics for e-portfolios. Um, and this was right before the pandemic started. So people were really interested um, and issues of privacy and protecting students. And then all of a sudden the pandemic happened and some interest really shifted there. Um, I, I, so we started developing these principles. I'll go to the next slide and maybe talk a little bit about them. The goal was to create some, I mean, I think like we're all familiar with in, in WAC and perhaps rhetoric and composition more broadly, some guiding principles that people could, for, for the community that people could then take into their local contexts. Um, and use as needed. Um, and these have changed. Um, there were 10 at the beginning and then there were 13 and now there's 10 again. Um, and certainly I'm, I invite you to explore those, but I was particularly involved um, in the creation of the visibility of labor principle along with um, Megan Mize, who is the, I wanna get her title correct. Um, she's the director for ePortfolios and digital initiatives at Old Dominion. Um, and Morgan Gresham, who is an associate professor and area director at the University of South Florida, uh, St. Petersburg. Um, and so this is just to kind of move us. Um, this is, in, in each principle sort of works this way. We have an abstract and a rationale and then some strategies um, for employing the principle and some, some examples of how it might um, play out for students, um, for faculty, for administrators, and then even for some e-portfolio platform. Um, providers. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole slide to you, but I, I wanted to pull this up here because what we were particularly interested in is thinking about all the labor that goes into, and I think some of your points earlier get to this, the work that students and faculty um, and staff and administrators have to do to make work, e portfolios work. And I think um, as we started thinking about this, we started thinking about it in terms of high impact practices more generally and just the amount of labor and a lot of it is invisible that goes into processes that we know improve education, um, but require a lot more than the sort of standard um, faculty practices as they were known in the past, right? Um, and thinking about who does that work and how they do that work and where we make space and time for that work was, was something we were really invested in. Um, so we created um, a study and I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. Um, but if you've been talking to me at all recently, you know I'm obsessed with this idea right now. And I'm obsessed with it because of my positionality um, in my role. So um, I um, originally started working at Appalachian State University as a non-tenure track faculty member in the English department. Um, and I was asked to be the rhetoric and compositions e-portfolio coordinator because I thought it was fun to code stuff. I mean, like literally they were like, oh, you're not scared of technology. You can do this thing, right? And I you know, was not trained to do it. It was like a hobby. It was something I did on the side, but I knew from my graduate training about portfolio practice more generally and App State's rhetoric and composition program had been a portfolio program 
long before e-portfolios were a thing. And so that was sort of, it was like the combination, right, of these things. And then when I joined this ABLE task force, I ended up meeting up with a lot of other people who were in very similar positions, right? They'd sort of ended up in these roles um, through a lot of sideways directions, right? Kind of other interests, other backgrounds. And um, so I moved through that um, and I started working as a WAC consultant. It was like an overload position, like 10 hours a week. You'll work with some faculty in these other areas. And our then director, uh, George Rhodes, who was the founder of our WAC program, had asked me to sort of keep gaining expertise in ePortfolios because they wanted to do more work with faculty. And, and that was kind of where I came into this task force situation. Um, my sort of colleagues working on this project, um, Megan similarly sort of came at ePortfolios. Um, I think her PhD was in like Renaissance theater studies. Um, but she was like, you know, I was a gaming nerd and I was like really into how do we represent ourselves digitally and sort of entered this role sideways, right? And now she's doing things with virtual reality and like that role has grown in really interesting ways for her. Um, Megan Haskins, who was originally working with us on this, was getting her uh, doctorate at the University of Denver, I think. Um, and she was working in their team teaching and learning center and she's since left higher ed right she found it like that was like later um, is, so I'm really interested in like labor issues in higher ed and particularly how we are positioned and how um how we can continue to make our work sustainable and do what we know is important but we also know like there are more and more contingent uh, faculty there are more and more people in positions like mine which is a staff position and like what does that look like um, and how do we sort of create boundaries around well, I'm, I'm looking at our current director because this is an ongoing conversation that we have about how do we create <laughs> boundaries around our roles so that we're not trying to be experts in everything um, so we wanted to contribute to this issue of across the disciplines because we see a lot of alignment between work that e-portfolio practitioners are doing and historically work that WPAs have done, that WACWID practitioners have done, and really thinking about what are the professional identities and boundaries around those identities. Um, and so I have this list here and I'm not, you, hopefully maybe you just, way more text I know than is supposed to be on a screen. Um, but I think I've highlighted the things that I bolded are things that I think um, a lot of people with backgrounds in WPA work or writing across the curriculum or writing in the disciplines work um, have done. Um, and it's also a lot of work that people in, in e-portfolio work are doing, these, kind, these characteristics of working in beautiful environments and productively using tensions in their work, making connections across the curriculum. And I wanted to highlight those in relation to our study before I sort of talk about it, because one of the things that I'm particularly interested in following through as we continue this, we're kind of in the middle of the study now, um, is understanding um, how we work rhetorically with our different audiences, because I think there's a lot of expertise um, coming from the WACWIC community that is, is useful for e-portfolio practitioners and can be combined there. So, um, just to, I'll talk a little bit about this and I won't get too much into the details. I'm gonna share a couple of our uh, quick findings, um, but we created the ePortfolio Mapping Project. And um, this was really inspired by um, the work of Chris Tyson Tara Porter on the WACWIN Mapping Survey and also the National Census for Writing. We really like investigated how those projects have worked over time. Um, we uh, transformed a lot of the questions to fit the ePortfolio context. If you haven't taken this survey, I invite you to take this survey. We're closing it at the end of July. It will have run for a year. Um, and we've tried to invite a lot of different participants um, to take place, but our basic research questions were who is doing ePortfolio work in higher ed? How is this work supported? Um, how is it acknowledged and what elements contribute to the sustainability and success of ePortfolio use? Um, so far, we've had a total of 58 responses and 26 of those um, were people who indicated that they are the primary ePortfolio person at their institution and have agreed to do interviews. So that's our, our next step in this coming year is to, to start interviewing those people and get more into the details of what their work looks like. Um, I can't see that very top, but I just wanted to share. Yeah, <laughs> this over here. Share, and I'm just going to talk about three findings. It's about a 20 minute survey if you take it, just so you know what you're kind of getting yourself into. But one of the questions that we asked, um, it's okay, John David, I'll say it. It was um, where, and I kind of slashed in the how because I think they overlap a little bit here. But where are e-portfolios used at your institution, um, and in what spaces? 
Um, and I think um, kind of to the point that only about half of our participants are their primary e-portfolio person on their campus. A lot of people who responded were sort of like, we're using them in individual classes, right? We don't, um, general education seemed really common, um, much less, I think, and, and to a point that I'm going to get at with our next data, career services, only 10 people said that's where they're being used. And I want to go back to that in a moment. The people who specified others indicated their honors college and some educational programs, practicums and clinical courses, um, which was something we hadn't thought about listing, but I think they are being used in a lot of spaces like that. Um, and then um, first year writing programs specifically in the, in internships and capstones. And then make sure that I'm talking about. I think you need to click on the PowerPoint again. Oh, uh, it is. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then again, something else we were kind of interested in is how, how are you working with campus partners and who are your campus partners? Um, I think I'm just going to point out the, the glaring hole here, which I'm kind of embarrassed, but I just have to say it. Um, Stacy Sheriff talked about like blind spot bias yesterday, <laughs> and this is blind spot bias. We didn't list WAC programs. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, oh my God, like that's where I'm going to pay. Um, anyway, the you know, next round of the study. Um, but important campus partners, um, career services, only eight people said that those were really important campus partners, and this will be important again in just a moment. But I think it's interesting to see technology support and instruction offices, writing centers, centers for teaching and learning, and assessment offices um, are really important um, for a lot of these. Um, and then I just like, it went on its own, magical. Um, these were why our e-portfolios being used. And, um, you know, as a WAC person, I was really excited that reflection and integrative learning were way up at the top. I was like, oh, that's awesome. That's great. Um, but preparing students for the workplace, 38 people said they're using them for preparing um, students for the workplace. But only eight of those people interact, or ten of those people interact with career services. Um, and so, one of the things we're kind of thinking about is like, where where are the boundaries of this expertise, right? And how much can we say, like, okay, I'm in this position, um, I need to be connecting with career services and connecting faculty with career services if that's what they want. Like, do I need to be an expert in everybody's industry and where they're graduating into, you know, how much can I do that um, and in what space? So that was, right now, that's one of the more interesting findings is thinking through how are people using e-portfolios versus who are they working with on campus? And a lot of our interview questions are going to be directed around um, that kind of expertise. Like, where do you see your expertise kind of stretching into places that you really are like, no, thank you. That's not like that. I would like to stay over here and be able to offer support in these ways, but that's kind of not my area. Um, and then, and maybe yeah, to the next slide really quickly. Um, we have been sort of doing workshops about um, this, trying to talk to lots of different groups. So we've done, we've talked to people at AAC and U and Four Cs and um, ePortfolio Australia and ePortfolio Ireland. So like trying to talk to people globally as well about how do you manage um, manage the labor and uh, what are some ways that we can navigate that. And so this is just a quick list of like strategies that those workshops have come up with, right? Um, that those have come sort of from the community. Um, and I wanted to list those. They're kind of less of the focus of our article, but I think they're useful again, because a lot of them align with the stuff that I think a lot of the ideas and awkward people are always thinking about. Um, so I think that's all right. We want to take some minutes. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Yeah, yeah I have a quick question for, for Chris and then sort of a general question for, for everybody. The quick question, recognizing that this is often a moving target, when when do you think hope that the um uh, possibly the same institution will be able to publish uh, in the fall sometime. Yeah. 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 But my general question is um some of a number of you spoke to this, but um what are some strategies that you've used to get faculty buy-in to get them interested in portfolio pedagogy and making use uh connecting with with you know these these really interesting programs, particularly when 
they don't have any particular reason to uh, that they might see to um, participate. I'll even take that a step farther and say a lot of them have reasons to actually not participate because yeah. this kind of thing is not rewarded in TNP in oh, engineering yeah. or the sciences. This is I've actually got a colleague who you know claims that working on portfolio pedagogy was part of why he was denied tenure. I think the bigger thing was that he told somebody off that had tenure before he had it. But, um, <laughs> but he said, uh, but yeah, and I'll tell you, the only way that we've been able to make that sale in engineering is to talk about, the engineers talk about coverage. They have so many things they have to get through. But if the engineering students aren't learning them in any depth, what good is the coverage? Yeah. So we have this conversation about depth of learning versus covering topics and which is more important. And some professors put up a big stop sign and I just have to say, yep, you go do your thing, good for you. But the ones that are willing to work are usually very motivated to do it because they see the problems of engineers not being able to communicate with non-engineers effectively or whatever. Um, and then so the buy-in has come from uh, working with them to understand what the benefit is, giving them help to do it. We have a studio system at LSU so that I, you know, we have full-time people that are there to swoop in, uh, you know, somebody like me to swoop in and help an English or an engineering professor tackle something that would ordinarily be done in an English class, right? Yeah. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about buy-in has been we have uh, in just about every department where we've had any kind of real success, we've had some high-profile professors who have participated, survived, and shared that survival with the rest of the department. So, you know, that's the, the help, the discussing the real benefit and being honest. And one other thing I'll say, it is extra work yeah. at first. Yeah. But once you've made the change, typically the work you are grading is of higher quality. So that makes life a little better. And then we also train a lot of these faculty in how to respond to writing, speaking, that kind of thing yeah. a little bit better, uh, active learning, things like that. And, you know, some of these ideas have been around a long time, but I'm telling you in engineering, they're still new. So, um, you know, training them the best ways to teach these things in the class has also been helpful. Yeah. So between the pioneers, the training, the help, and the frank discussions about what's reasonable versus what's possible. That makes me think very quickly about, you know, um, when I talk with colleagues who teach capstone courses in their department, so many gaps come up that yep. point to the rest of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. But then this seems like an interesting way to kind of pull folks back on that question. Yeah, and I would I would just add, I think, just to this point, right? So the potential for integration of learning yeah. and reflection is often the entry point, right? When yeah. we start to say that intentional reflection or to reflection intentionally scaffolded across the curriculum, even if you do nothing else with the with the portfolios. Mm -hmm can help the students get to that capstone position yeah. and be remembering what they know and how the parts fit together. Because I always will tell faculty, like, I can remember taking the midterm and exam and thinking, well, I never need to think about that anymore, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But that's not what we want. Yeah. I think that was, I just jump in very yeah. quickly, the Auburn program, that was a big selling point for me. And I used to joke about Margaret Marshall, I twisted my arm after the only use it again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that I saw quickly that the portfolio was not just the next big thing, but something that could actually help me address something I was thinking a lot about. I was teaching an intro course for our major and the capstone, and to get students to see their learning and the growth experience and to integrate their experiences. You know, I was struggling to figure out ways to do that and immediately saw what to do. It's pretty good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I would just also add that um, if you can get a couple of students invested, that that can make a huge difference. Um, the yeah. example I would would share is so part of my job is um, as the coordinator, uh, the DigiSpace coordinator, is to have a team of students that help uh, deliver the the basically tutoring that goes along with the portfolio. So there, it's like a drop in tutoring model, similar. It's we're based in the learning center. Um, so essentially, having like working with them more directly to say, okay, what is your major? How do you think this is going to work in your major? How do we think we have, like, how can we build that? And I had the luxury of being able to pay them to do that, right? You yeah. know, to say like, hey, if you have drop-in hours this many hours a week, you're not going to have that many people come by. I want you to let's work on how you're going to do this and what projects are you going to develop? 
once you can help them see that, then you can then take that to the faculty and say like, yeah. here's one example, like, and yeah. this was, this is how I did this with a student. They decided what they wanted to put in there. They decided where good connections would be. Yeah. Um, and so the student testimonial part is also really important. Um, and I found that has been a huge, um, well, I guess I shouldn't say I've found yet. I'm hoping um, that will be a huge motivator for some students to see, here are some students, hey, this person graduated last year. This is how they used it. Um, we have a great testimonial for, from one of the ABSNs who graduated a few years ago um, and who basically said, uh, I think I got this position because of my e-portfolio and, yeah. and just went on to explain like, uh, you know, and when you look at the portfolio, when I looked at it, I was just like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> it was not really well built and, it, you know, it was just, but the, the whoever was interviewing him did look at it because he shared yeah. it. And again, we have the option of public or private and yeah. in the WordPress site. So, so students can choose to make them not public if they want to, we encourage them to make them public. But again, how much they share them is another other thing that yeah. needs to be um, we need to explore but again having that person say it was about the e-portfolio um, but also looking at the benefit for the student as not even if they choose not to share it how does it help to curate it yeah. you have to start looking through all these different things because that's another space we re really need a lot of work on is where do we help them stop and look back and think forward, right? So like, yeah. and, and that is another place that I think we could do better with, yeah. but it's a, it's really important because they get to the end and they built it and that half of them haven't thought about what's in it because they're still seeing it as like an assignment, right? So we have to get past that. That makes me think about our, our writing center where we're co-housed the central role for it. Mm -hmm. we've, we've actually, I'll just say real quickly that we now have our writing center of your consultants create an e-portfolio as part of their professional development. Um, and so that goes back to the e-portfolios curriculum because we don't have a writing center class, right? They they get it through ongoing training with us. And so they all make one, they have, you know, writing center artifacts as well as stuff from their uh, major, et cetera. But Miriam, were you going to have that experience we've had too. So we're working on it just like that. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to go to Karen's point um, because I think that we speak down when we're talking about student work. Mm -hmm. um, okay. We use the that portfolio in our master's program. It's very difficult to get faculty to agree that students need some time and some course credit for working on that. Mm -hmm. They're not just going to roll everything at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it also invites faculty to be transparent with students um, about their own work. Um, and this actually goes to reflection. I wondered. I uh, wanted to ask how students learn to write reflection in your program. Um, and so many times early in our project, faculty would say, people aren't sure don't reflect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, so how when faculty might be unaccustomed to a kind of writing they are willing to call reflective, how do you teach that to students? Um, I guess I could take a stab at that one. Um, I think where the way that we try to present it is um, through the prompt, where in this obviously still needs a lot of work, um, but the prompts are meant to help students sort of see something like we, we, we try to be intentional with those prompts, right? What are we asking them to interact with? And into what level? And again, you saw that intro prompt. It's not as good as it could be. Um, but also, we're going to work toward rubric use as well. Again, just to to help them see like what, what am I supposed to be including here, right? Which we right now these prompts are not scored individually. They're just if you did it or if you didn't, right? So, um, but I think also I would say we have the luxury in our BSN program to work with uh, the English 110 students who almost all of them take English 110. And that's where they learn to do some of that reflective work because they they build, they start their portfolio in English 110. And then at the end of the semester, they have to go back and explain how they met course learning objectives with artifacts. So most of them have been through that process. Um, with the ABSNs, it's another story because they come from all over the place. So I don't have a, a good answer, I guess, but I would say that there's opportunity in that beginning English course that could allow for builds for others. I had a, this is not my idea, but a brilliant disciplinary faculty member once in one of our conversations with them through the running across the curriculum program said, 
and I think it's a chemistry class. Well, we do, you know, they tend to say we don't do reflection. And she said, oh, we do reflection all the time. It's in the discussion section. And I bring that up constantly in conversations mm -hmm. with disciplinary faculty who feel like they don't do it because it's it's literally part of the structure of their formal publications. Yeah. If they just call it something different, right? right? Yeah. But I, I'm fine to call students mm -hmm. the attention to that. Even yeah. in my own situation, mm -hmm. sometimes I ask them to write how I changed my mind and why. Mm -hmm. um, and I often talk about how my own thinking about something mm -hmm. uh, has changed. But um, yeah, I think thank you. I'll also say the first time I ever saw a formal presentation on how to do reflective writing well, it was delivered by a biological engineering professor. Um, and I stole her slides and I've used them ever since. <laughs> but, um, you know, the labor problem. <laughs> uh, but we also do it with the, uh, the prompts and then hopefully with some of the interactions with the faculty. And uh, I didn't mention that in addition to working with an advisor at our program, the coordinators uh, in the different disciplines also work with the students. So we try to give them some of that as well. But I, I wish we had a much more uh, streamlined and effective way to teach them. Uh, usually what we use is just loosely the sort of the what, so what, now what model. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I also, I just wanted to add to your earlier point. So two of the principles are about support and practice, and they focus explicitly on the need to give students and faculty the time, right, to practice, to learn, like it is another skill, it is more cognitive load um, to do this work and like to make time and space for that as part of your curriculum building is really important. Okay. Um, well, thank you all. Well, we've been thinking a lot about this on our campus because we've had a lot of changes um, to our program. But, um, we have a, a, one office that's devoted to um, leading the effort on new portfolios, and that director is retiring, and they decided to close the office and sort of not really well, they thought they might just do away with it. Um, <laughs> And so we've been trying to respond to this, but one of the reasons why we had this office in the first place is there was a vision on our campus of doing longitudinal assessment using digication. So everyone would use digication, students would use it in every class. That did not actually end up happening for various reasons, but um, we still want to do longitudinal assessment, um, even though people are using various different programs for different reasons. Um, we have a, vert a vertical writing model that um, requires students to take a course in each of their four years in that flesh. And so um, there's a reflective component and there's the suggestion of an e-portfolio at the two upper level courses. Um, but we're finding doing the longitudinal assessment through WAC, which was one of the purposes of adopting this program and having this office in the first place, is not followed suit because of the way that it rolled out in all these different programs. I'm wondering if you all have any experience with doing longitudinal assessment um, either using the same program that like other people in the same college do or across various programs. And if you do, how do you get faculty to give you artifacts <laughs> or access to the artifacts that which was the reason to have digitation in the first place? Don't know what I'm asking. So I can say a little bit about our assessment institute. Um, so we're platform agnostic. Uh, so we don't even zero in on WordPress. They can use Wix, Weebly, WordPress, anything like that. Um, and the way that uh, that Margaret and the team set up, um, we did two instances of it. It could have it could have continued if the QEP had demanded it or whatever. So we did it was in 2016 and in, and in 2018. And um, uh, the main collection was actually direct to students, asking them for their URLs to their e-portfolios. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, so it kind of bypassed the faculty in a way. We, I think they probably did ask faculty to connect them with students in some cases, right? But it wasn't, the fa all the faculty had to do is like send an email. They didn't actually have to provide documents. Um, so you go directly to the e-portfolios. And then, you know, we were assessing the e-portfolios themselves, right? But I could see a way in which then you could go in looking for, for specific kinds of artifacts mm -hmm. and pull those out. And that puts more labor on you um to yeah. to Sarah's point but um but that might be one way to go about that perhaps there is this important difference though like that is we were assessing the portfolio project and yeah portfolio sort of working. Mm -hmm. and uh in our program historically and I, you and I have talked about it there was fairly significant 
and a risk and put the idea of giving portfolio for a campaign on the notion that that would really complicate and undermine some of the other things we've done. Mm -hmm. Student ownership over the ways they were representing themselves yeah. in their work and curating stuff. And I'm, I'm here adopting Barbara's beliefs, which I can't believe because she argues very formally <laughs> <laughs> that it's, it's an integrated e portfolio rather than. Yeah. But they still could be used for assessment after the fact. You just don't want to front load that for that what reason. We're looking for. Were reflective, right? Yeah. Evidence of reflection was what we wanted to, and we did. I mean, we we did look for it. It was just incredibly difficult in order to just only have faculty who provided because they sent us stuff that didn't show anything about reflection. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. So thank you. That's yeah. helpful. Well, we are past time. So thank you all for your questions and for listening and uh, enjoy the last few minutes of the conference. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here. 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 I've been here.